Today, a conversation with Steve King. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to our latest post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. And it's my great pleasure to have Steve Keane with me today. Hello, Steve. Good to meet you, Martin, finally, after all these years. <laughs> yeah, we've been tic-tacking on and off over the years, but yeah. uh, finally we get together. Welcome to uh, this location and yeah. welcome to Australia. Thank you. I'm going to come back every year for my mother's birthday. For those who... Uh, my mother's actually sitting behind the, the screen here. Uh, 94, 94 this birthday, so... I, when I went to Europe, I said one thing I don't want to do is lose touch with my family. So I'm here every July for her birthday, and that looks like going for another 10 or 15 years, the way she's going. Uh, that's brilliant, brilliant to hear. Excellent. Yeah. Well, it's great to have you uh, here with us in the studio, live, as it were. Mm. Now, we did, a, we did a show about a year ago, right? Mm. And at that stage, we were talking about... Um, you know that the, the debt was was growing. The mm. the chances are that um, the uh, authorities here in Australia will stoke the debt up again, right? You know, yep. and, and we'll we'll go around the houses a bit more, a bit more, right? Yeah. And I remember we talked about icebergs and the fact that they didn't seem to be seeing that there was a real issue, right? Yeah. yeah. So here we are a year later, and guess what? They are, really are turning the taps. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. I mean, anyways, when I saw the uh, the Royal Commission strike, I thought that's got to be a body blow to the rise in debt, which has actually financed the whole housing bubble. Yeah. Uh, and then the first uh, uh, hole in there, and I think you actually may have pointed it out that the though the the, the, the brilliant uh, uh, Rowena uh, Orr, brilliant inquiry she did there, exposing the absolutely fraudulent lending that the banking sector has done that has financed this bubble. Yeah. And then you get a damn squib of a report, and I think it was you who said Treasury is the main author of the damn thing. <laughs> Correct, exactly. Well, you know, back it's, it's, you know, like a handing over, that's getting the foxes to write the report about the raids on the hen house. Yeah. And uh, so it was a damn squib of a final report. Uh, and then, of course, the next stage is we're all expecting a Labor victory. And I was, did you see my post I wrote about that? I did. You know, <laughs> saying that I'd rather hand, like it's, it's a hospital pass of an election. So yes. if you've got a choice of who to give the ball to, I'd give it to the Liberals. Yeah. Well, lo and behold, that's what actually happens. <laughs> and of course, now Morrison, who's most famous for two things, uh, being on the property council himself and loving lumps of coal, <laughs> uh, is now back in charge and will do everything he can to try to revive the bubble. So even after we see the level of just fraud's the only way to describe the level of lending. Um, and yet the APRO puts the brakes on for three weeks and then says, oh dear, the market's slowing down, Musk can't have that, let's go back to fraudulent lending again, put in rather more polite terms than that. And so they've dropped their standards on regulation, there have been two rate cuts already, which is even faster than I thought it'd happen, mm. uh, everything to get the housing bubble back on track again. Yeah. So my question to you, Steve, is how much debt is too much debt? I'd say too much debt is about one third the level of debt Australia is currently carrying. Right. Uh, because when I look at the um, what the function of debt is, we actually want to see what is a legitimate function for credit. To me, a legitimate function for the legitimate functions are at the household level to provide large sums of money when people want to buy items that are too expensive to save for out of their income. So automobiles are an obvious one, and so are, so are houses to live in. Uh, and the other legitimate functions are to provide money to corporations for working capital. So firms need to have a buffer if they have an increase in costs through, through you know, increasing oil prices or increasing wages. They can meet it immediately without you know, facing a, a credit crunch and having to go back to the bank to get lending. That's what lines of credit used to do. And providing funds to entrepreneurs. And I define an entrepreneur as somebody with a good idea but no money. And those are, the, those are the three sectors that I believe the finance sector should be servicing. But instead, uh, the finance sector sees money in providing uh, money to households to buy houses, not as places to live in, but places to speculate on. And you get a, feedback, a positive feedback in technical terms. Positive means negative, by the way. It's not a good thing. Uh, where the increasing level of debt allows an increasing level of house prices, which encourages an increasing level of debt. And you get an exponential increase in the level of debt to GDP, which keeps on going until such point as either people can no longer service the debt and you start having bankruptcies and it falls over, uh, or you have... Um, banks themselves becoming worried about the level of exposure they have, the lending stops, and when that stops, the flow of credit, which is the change in debt, 
can go negative and that drops you into a slump. And Australia has managed to avoid that slump now for 25 years uh, by doing everything they can to encourage households back into more and more debt. Um, so if you look at what households should be carrying as debt, as a percentage of GDP, I'd say it's of the order of 20, 25, 30 percent of GDP. Instead, they're carrying 120 percent of GDP. So I'd literally say three quarters of that should never have been lent in the first place. And the look at the business sector, it's now carrying of the order of about 70 percent of GDP, uh, 70 to 80 percent. Those are the levels that reach back under us, those well-known, leading, innovative Australian entrepreneurs, Christopher Scase and Alan Bond. Uh, it was all funding speculation by business. Uh, back when you look at when there was decent lending for the level of debt that, that corporations need was of the order of 50% of GDP. So I think we're running at about 200%. We're about 125% above where we should be. So it's interesting. I think Guy DeBell at the end of last year said he didn't know what, how much too much debt is. Yeah. Right? Um, so what does that tell us about the Reserve Bank? Well, the Reserve Bank hasn't got a bloody clue. I mean, I, I have dealt... I'll give you my favourite instance about the Reserve Bank. Let's, let's, be, let's be personal about this. <laughs> okay. I gave a talk in Adelaide, uh, and uh, one of the speakers, and he's a good bloke. I'm not going to knock him as a person. Guy DeBell, okay? Good, good, good bloke. It's sort of like you'd like to have around for a barbecue. Hmm. And I gave my paper about... Uh, my whole analysis is on the role of private debt and credit in macroeconomics, which, for those that don't understand this, macroeconomic theory leaves banks, debt and money out of their macroeconomic models. It doesn't simply exist in mainstream economics, so it's a complete absence. On the other hand, I take them completely seriously and they're essential to my analysis of the economy. So I gave my talk and a guy gave his, and at the end of it, he said, sorry guy, you might like me saying this, but uh, this, is, this is where it happened. He said, I don't know why you worry about the level of private debt because that's comparing a stock to a flow. <laughs> now, <laughs> I was too flabbergasted to make an answer. Uh, but you can bear a stock to a flow for all sorts of good reasons. Um, you know, a, a stock carrying a flow to a stock you have to service tells you how much of your income you're using to service that debt. And if you look at the ratio of debt to GDP, you've got uh, dollars, which is the amount of money you're owed, compared to GDP, which is dollars per year. That comparison tells you how many years it would take to repay the debt. And secondly, um, mainstream economists, including people like Guy DeBell, f fixate all the time on the government's debt to GDP ratio. So that's a stock to flow comparison. Mm -hmm. So I was just flabbergasted by the, by the very statement. Mm -hmm. And the next week, uh, mate, my little mate Rory Robinson, who again is a good guy, and I've got to friendship with Roy, Rory these days, wrote a piece saying Keynes making a typical schoolboy error of comparing a stock to a flow. Now, you can make stock to flow errors, errors when you add a stock to a flow, okay? That's an error, okay? But comparing is a different story entirely. So they just completely leave the level of credit out of their thinking. And the most recent instance of that was, I mean, you, you must know the person whose name I'm going to mention. You want to say his name? Mr. Tulip. There him, Dr. Tulip. <laughs> Dr. Tulip, Sorry, one of the, the Reserve Bank's leading yep. economists. And yep. Tulip came out with a model of the Australian housing market with something like about 25 variables in it. And one of the variables was not the level of credit. There was a previous paper by the Reserve Bank which was talking about the supply of credit, the role of credit in the housing market, or some title like that, I've forgotten who wrote it. And it did actually have a graph. It did have a graph of the ratio of debt to GDP. One graph. And then the entire discussion about credit had nothing to do about the volume of credit. It was how easy it was to get a loan. It was surveys yep. of banks. So I think it was a ratio of business debt to credit they showed in that particular article. Mm. So they have their typical products of mainstream economic thinking. They're very much the cardboard cutout textbook version of economics. And in that theory, credit plays no role in aggregate demand. Therefore, they don't even look at it. They collect the data. It's, you and I use data from the Reserve Bank all the time. Yep. But they collect the data and then ignore it. And it's because their teaching tells them that credit plays no, no role at the macro economy because credit is just a, to quote my, one of my other favourite economists, who's not a nice bloke, Paul Krugman, <laughs> uh, he said, credit is simply a transfer of people, money from patient people who want to lend to impatient people. People, lend to impatient people. And in that vision of credit, credit is a transfer from one non-bank to another non-bank 
uh, and therefore the amount of money in one person's bank account goes down so they can spend less. The amount of bank money in somebody else's bank account goes up so they can spend more. And then when the repayment occurs, the opposite occurs. So there's no change in the aggregate amount of money in the economy courtesy of lending, and there's no change in spending power, and they ignore it. And that is completely and utterly wrong. Yeah, and of course the Bank of England and other people make the point that actually bank can create they credit. create money when they yeah. lend yeah i mean i know if you, if you how much of the academic literature you followed in this over the years Martin? reasonable amounts you know I've basil got... moore and people yeah. like that okay. yeah. yeah well basil moore uh, was the first to revive this idea in uh, modern economic theory in mm. 1979 he wrote a paper the Endo the endogenous money stock and his argument was that uh the, 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 the conventional teaching about the role of money in the economy is that uh, the government uh, lend, gives money to like the, you know, the, 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 the all-powerful welfare recipient, receives a check for $100, goes to the bank and deposits that $100. The bank, who's currently at their, at their limits, their, their reserve ratio limits, says, oh, thank you for that 100 so we'll hang on to 10 of that and lend out 90 to somebody else. And then that person puts that 90 in a bank and the bank hangs on to 89 and then it's at 81 and so on. And ultimately out of that $100 injection, you get 1,000 created. And it's, but it's all the amount of money being injected is controlled by the central bank and the ratio of lending is controlled by the central bank. So the central bank's in control of the amount of money. That is, as Basil argued decades ago, translating it into Australian terms, that's bullshit. Yeah? But that wasn't what happened at all. The banks uh, have, uh, you've got to think about banks in an, in an accounting sense. Assets and minus liabilities equals equity. And banks, to remain uh, liquid, have to have positive equity. So they start with, say, they might start with 100 million in equity. That means they've got an asset of 100 million and no liabilities. That's their initial situation. They then might, let's say, they lend instantly lend 100 million. They create 100 million in assets for themselves of debt. So they've now got 200 million in assets. They create liabilities of 100 million as well, which is extra bank deposits. So when they create debt, they create money. And then, from my point of view, this is what I've added to the analysis. Um, that nobody else worked out, and it still stuns me that nobody else beat me to this. But that is, nobody borrows for the sheer pleasure of being in debt. No. You borrow to spend. Yep. So when you borrow, that change in money becomes a change in demand. And credit, therefore, is an essential part of aggregate demand. And when you look at it in the American case, for example, at the, at the peak of the bubble before the financial crisis began, change in debt, which is credit, was 15% of GDP. At the depth of the crisis, change in debt, which is credit, was minus 5% of GDP. So you had a 20% turnaround in aggregate demand. Uh, now the Reserve Bank knows none of that. I, I can show the correlation between credit, which is change in private debt, and unemployment in America is minus 0.85 between 1990 and now. And they, they assume it's zero. Mm. And they don't even check. Mm. I have been producing graphs like that for 20, 15 years. Right. They simply don't even look at them because that's not in our data. That's blindfolded. And of course, the fact that the rate of change of credit has been easing yeah. over the last couple of years in Australia yeah. explains why suddenly the economy is actually crashing, why household consumption is going backwards yep. and all of those things. And now, of course, the Treasury and everybody else is panicking, right? mm. which is why they're turning up the credit taps. Yep. So implicitly, whether they are understanding all those relationships or not, what mm. they're actually doing is they're turning the credit control up yeah. Yeah. to try and actually boost the economy again. Yeah, and this is something both parties have done this. So, like, my last experience, our last experience of this was under Rudd. Yep. And, like, I, you might remember, you probably do remember, I was interviewed on the 7.30 report for half the show yeah. uh, and with Kerry O'Brien going deep in detail through my re research and asked me about the house prices. That's when I made the, you know, the, the comparison to Japan saying house prices had fallen 40% there over the 10 to 15 years since their bubble economy burst and I see no reason why that won't happen here. Mm. Well the next day he savaged Kevin Rudd for the whole program and one week later Rudd came out with a stimulus program which had things like you know the thousand dollars cash yep. back to everybody which I completely approved of. The idea of the um, you know the, the pink bats which was a travesty in how it was done but it's a sensible idea. Uh, the, the school buildings and doubling and trebling what I call the first home vendors boost, restarted the housing bubble, yep. kept it going till halfway 2010. They were supposed to come in for six months, wasn't it? It lasted one and a half years. Yep. 
Um, just like when, when the first home owners grant was brought back in by Howard, it was there for six months to get us over the, the shock of the GST and being the, the little snowflakes we are in Australia, it kept going for 10 years, you know, yeah. everything to boost the housing market. So the Treasury at least understands that if you want to give the economy a kick start, you boost the housing market. And that's what's been used every time there's been a downturn. Right. And, and one of the things that you know, quite a few people, I won't mention any particular people who say this, but actually the only thing to look at is serviceability of debt. Yeah. So yeah. as interest rates go Come lower down, and lower and lower, debt. that means that you can just borrow more. Yeah. Um, which always seems to me to be an amazing argument, right? So actually, firstly, if you look at the real data from the RBA, the serviceability is going backwards mm. even now with yeah. the very low interest rates we've got. Yeah. But secondly, just looking at serviceability surely misses the point, doesn't it? It does miss the point. And this is the, because what people say is that you know, it doesn't matter how much debt they take on so long as they can service that debt. Well, that'd be true if, if, if debt played no role in demand. Yeah. Okay? Well, what I'm saying, and this, this has took me a long time to work out this technically properly, that aggregate demand, I used to say, aggregate demand is the sum of GDP plus change in debt. Now, the correct statement is aggregate demand is the sum of the turnover of existing money plus credit. So if you have a, if you think about the level of aggregate demand in the economy and it's growing over time, which is necessary for you know, the economy to expand, uh, then to have a continuous rate of expansion, if that includes, for example, credit being 10% of GDP, then you've got to keep it at 10% of GDP. So if it gets to the point where debt stabilises and they then say, well, serviceability is fine, therefore there'll be no problem. No, the problem is that 10% of aggregate demand has just disappeared because your reliance, your, your demand was coming from partly turnover of existing money, but then 10% of it, let's say, was coming from rising debt. Well, now 10% has disappeared. You have a 10% fall in aggregate demand. You will have a recession. Hmm. Okay, so what we're really saying is that, yeah, serviceability is one element, but there's a whole bunch of other moving parts yeah. to this equation. And if you don't understand the equation, then you, you don't pull the levers the right way. That's right. Well, you've yep. got a model yep. which fits the data and is completely wrong. <laughs> right. Okay. So I call it Ptolemaic economics these days. You know? <laughs> right. The Ptolemaics had a, a brilliant model that fitted the data about the motions of the planets and was completely wrong. You know, Earth, Earth in the centre, Sun and the Moon orbiting us in circles, the, the Mars circ orbiting us like this, you know. Yep. If Elon Musk was aiming for Mars, he'd need to get the right loop. You know? <laughs> and, of course, it fitted the data because they spent all this time getting intricate measurements and making the circles on the circles the right size and the right speed of rotation and so on. Yes, they fitted the data, and it did not describe anything about the real solar system. Same way in economics, that model by, by, by Tulip. Talk about predestination. <laughs> uh, market model by Tulip. Uh, has 25 equations, fits the data, and when credit goes the opposite direction, will be completely wrong. Yeah. So the Copernican re revolution really is to understand that debt's right at the centre of all of this, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and Money's that, at the centre. Yeah, yeah. And this is the ironic thing. Most non-economists would think economists are experts on money. <laughs> In fact, going back to the formation of the neoclassical theory back in the 1870s, one of the things that Volrar left out of his model of a, a multi-market economy was money, yeah. because he thought it would make it too complicated. So he simplified it by leaving out money and imagining all exchanges barter. Now, OK, I can understand Volrar making that decision in 1870, but they've ossified with <laughs> that attitude. And every time we try to bring money into the economics, they drive it out. And they talk about anybody who talks about money mattering is suffering from money illusion. And I say what they actually suffer from is barter illusion. Trying to I believe that a capitalist economy is a barter system is total nonsense because first of all, it ain't. And secondly, there has never been an economy based on barter in the first place. When anthropologists like David Graeber look back through history and try to find examples of barter-based economies, they find zero. Every economy that has ever functioned after, we, after the invention of, of large-scale human societies has been a credit economy using money. And capitalism is a, is a credit economy par excellence, and we need to model it with credit playing an absolutely fundamental role. Very, very insightful, Steve. Thank you for that. And just, you, I have to ask though, house prices in Australia clearly are going to be wobbling around for a yeah. bit. 
I don't see anything in what happens in the last couple of months to say there's going to be a massive turnaround. Do you? Sort of no, I feel the same way. Yeah. I mean, there's going to be a bit of a. I, actually, there's a, one of the um, Twitter people you're probably aware of, the the professor demographic. Yes. Okay. Had a wonderful line saying it's going to be a Schrodinger's cat bounce. Yes. Which I replied saying you mean a, not, a dead, a dead, not dead, dead cat bounce. Yes. So I think there will be a bit of a wobble because with the rates being dropped by the RBA, yeah. going to panic mode to res rescue it. With Morrison at the helm, he'll do anything he can to rescue the housing bubble. Yeah. Uh, but at the moment, you, you're trying to rescue it when we're carrying a debt level of 120% of GDP for households. Yep. Um, it might rise a bit for a while. That will give you a positive credit boost and the accelerator will become seriously positive for a while. It can go up a while, but we're not going to carry much more than 125% of GDP as the debt level. So I'll see it reaching that peak and then it reaches a flat line. Then credit demand disappears. Then the accelerator turns negative and back down again. So a little, a little bubble, potentially. But it'll run out because if you are going to achieve rising house prices, you must have ultimately rising household debt. And we're already number two in the world. We might take out the one plus, Aussie, 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 you know, <laughs> beat the Swiss. Yay, can't beat Federer at tennis, but we can beat the Swiss at household debt and then down again, um, maybe over a year or two. So he can delay the, he can delay the crisis. Uh, and that's what Australia has been doing for the last 27 years. Yeah. Uh, but I think he's got maybe one year in it, and then hopefully in his final a few months of his term or year, year of his term, it'll start looking tropo again, and it'll be just too late. Steve, I really appreciate your time today. Thank you. It's been a really insightful uh, been conversation. Great, great to finally meet face to face. Indeed. Thank you very much. Yep. Cheers.